We have a lot to cover in a short period of time, so I'm going to be moving quickly with you, and it is an interactive program. This is me, Ron. Uh, nice to meet you. I am what you would call one of those people who really is a man on a mission. I'm one of those guys who loves what he does, is passionate about it, and enjoys bringing it to different audiences all over the world. I think I'm going to enroll you in the mission, and we'll check on that by the end of the day. I've been based in Singapore for the past 22 years. So people say to me, why Singapore? How'd you get there? I went there for a one-week project as a consultant. It's been a very long week. <laughs> the objective of that project was to take an entire country that was focused on low-cost manufacturing and convenient geographical positioning and reposition it for a world where all the manufacturing went to China, all the back office operations went to India and to other low-cost areas, and all this entire country was left with was a small island with people. No natural resources, no oil reserves, no, uh, no agricultural background, right? And the future of the country had to shift to be able to continue to create value for the world, for people like you and me. So if you look at Singapore today, not only does it have a number one airline and a number one airport, but it's a financial center, it's an educational center, it's a research center, it's a legal center, it's an insurance center, it's a convention center. All of that has to do with service. But the entire population had not been educated or prepared for service. They'd been educated and prepared to go to work in the factories. So there was an entire national transformation that had to be done, and I was privileged to be part of that. It's still my home base. I live there with my wife, and we're on a lot of airplane flights every year. Sometimes we get lucky and get to come to a place like being here with you. Okay? The program will require that you have a partner. You need another human being that you can talk to, ask questions, listen to what they have to say. So I'm going to ask you in just a moment to choose someone to be your partner, but I'll make it easy. Would you please rub your hands together? Rub, just rub your hands together. Okay, clap twice. <laughs> hands up. When I say go, all you have to do is turn right or turn left and say to the person next to you, please be my partner. Ready? Go, go. No, 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 I'm gonna check, I'm gonna check. I'm gonna say one, two, three, and you go like this. Ta-da, show me your partner. Here we go, one, two, three. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. So a couple of people went like this, and people on both, <laughs> please don't leave anyone alone. Let somebody have, okay. There are three objectives of today's program. It's to make sure that you step out of here with at least one action step, something that you can do to apply what we're gonna cover, either to make you more effective as a leader in your organization, or to make your team more effective as within your organization, or to make your whole organization more effective. Turn to your partner and just let them know which of those three levels are you gonna focus on for this morning. As you walk in, what concern is in mind? Your own effectiveness and performance, your team's effectiveness and performance, or your organization? Ready? Turn to your partner, go. Good, good, okay. So, number one airline in the world. Let's just dig into this for a second, right? Who makes their aircraft? Boeing and Airbus. Who makes the aircraft for almost every other airline on the planet? Boeing and Airbus. So it's difficult to differentiate based on that, right? Do you think that they're number one because they fly to better airports? Better travel agents? Better website? No, but they've differentiated in a way that has allowed them to become not only ranked number one, but one of the most profitable airlines in the world in an industry where air airlines go out of business from time to time. Yeah, how'd they do that? Yeah, they differentiated based on the service experience. Now, by the way, they actually have two cultures. One is a service excellence culture. The other is a cost effectiveness culture. I'll give you an example of that later on during the program. I've been working with them for 22 years. I know some of their secrets. My job is to bring some of that to you. Does anyone recognize the architecture? Okay, it's called Marina Bay Sands. Sheldon Adelson in Las Vegas owns it. Right? It's a building that went up in three years with 2,600 hotel rooms, a sky park on the 57th story, Casino, a million square feet of convention space, 300 retail outlets, 50 food and beverage outlets, 8,500 staff, and they opened it really, really early. Like they weren't really, really ready. And so the TripAdvisor scores when they first opened up weren't so hot. 
Uh, in social media world, that's a real concern because any customer unhappy with anything about you can tell everybody, right? So we started working with them. This is the results in six months of just applying what it is that's in the book that you got and that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Changi International Airport, number one airport in the world. Now remember, all three of these are happening in a tiny island that has less land mass than five times Manhattan and less than five million people. Right? And how do they do this? They've got 42 million visitors a year, 28,000 people go to work every day, but only 1,300 actually work for the airport authority. Everybody else is from some other organization in the ecosystem. So it could be a bank, it could be the police, it could be customs, it could be immigration, it could be the airline, but they've all got to work absolutely together because let me ask you, if you're in an airport and you're lost, if you're in an airport and you're looking for something, who will you ask? Turn to your partner. Turn to, you're, you're in the airport, you're looking for something, who will you ask? Turn to your partner. Who? Who will you ask? Anyone. Anyone that looks like they work there, right? Which means the person who works in the pharmacy needs to know where the gates are. The person at the gate needs to know where the post office is. You need everybody being willing and ready to take care of everybody. Yep. Clear? So it's an entire service ecosystem. And then we created that with this kind of a mission. Many partners, many missions, one Changi. This is the problem in most large organizations. We recruit for this, marketing says that. We pay for this, we promise that. The customer asks for this, the boss focuses on that. I can see you're already giggling over here at the table, which means you, this looks familiar. Okay, my work with organizations and my objective with you is to make this look like that. By the way, that's all Singapore Airlines has been doing for 39 years. It's not that they're spending more, They've just figured out how to take every single thing that could impact the overall culture of an organization and get them aligned with each other to produce a common result. I'm going to check right now and see how aligned we are in this room. You know that the fundamental topic of the talk is about service. So what is that? This is not an unusual word. If you're working in business, you've heard the word. If you're a consumer, you're concerned about the word. But what is your definition of this simple word, service? So I'm going to propose a fundamental definition and then we'll see whether it works for your job and your position in your organization, okay? Would you agree with me that service only happens if someone does something for someone else, okay? So service means taking some kind of action, right? Service doesn't sit in a box up on the shelf. Now the action that you take has got to be something that matters to the person that you're doing it for, true? Some people would say it's got to be what they need. Some would say it's what they want. Some would say it's to their expectations. Some would say it creates satisfaction. I'm going to say that all of that is about creating value. So here's a simple definition. Service is taking some action to create some value for someone else. OK, if it's self-service, you're taking the action to create value for yourself. Right? But I want to check on this. Because we have people in the room who do investment, who do construction, who do research, who do facilities management. Does this definition make sense given what you do in your organization? Is there some action you're responsible for and the purpose of it is to create some value for and that someone else could be your end customer, it could be your internal colleague, it could be somebody within your economic ecosystem, it could be the government, right? Does this definition make sense for you? Are you taking some action, the purpose of which is to create some value for, so I'm going to call that service. Now, let's, let's move ahead here. What then is excellence in service? What is excellence in service? Excellence in service, like service performance, is giving somebody a higher experience, right? Well, they would say not only was that of good value, but it was better value. What is this? What is a culture of service excellence? I just want to pause because I know we have a lot of engineers in the room, <laughs> right? I mean, frequently people hear the word service and they go, oh, that's the soft side, right? That's the after-sale customer service side of things. I think you can see that's not the way I think about it. Often you hear the word service, people say it's the soft side, then you add the word culture and they think it's really fuzzy, like humanities only, right? <laughs> not the case. 
Talk to your partner for a second. What is a culture where everyone understands and is committed to and takes action to create an excellent service experience? More value for someone else. Talk to your partner. What is that? Okay, good. Come on back again. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And obviously these two are related. Excellent service performance and the reputation that comes from that and the return customer and the profitability that comes from it and a culture where people understand it, they're related to one another. Huh? The big question that I've been working on is this one. How do you actually build a culture of service excellence? How come Singapore Airlines could do that and so many airlines struggle with it? How come you can have an airport like Changi International Airport but you've got other airports in the world where, well, you know what I mean. So fundamentally, there's an architecture that I've developed from working for 22 years with different organizations all over the world. Does anyone recognize this location? Petra and Jordan. Does anyone recognize the woman I'm with? <laughs> That's my wife. Her name is Jen. She's from Australia. She does all the travel with me and makes sure all the logistics work well. She's in the back of the room. Would you join me in just giving her a clap of appreciation? <laughs> Ma, thank you, sweetheart. All right. So that architecture is really old, and it was designed intentionally to influence human behavior. It was a market, right? You could have a choir in there. Things would work within that shape. So I stole the shape. I adopted it. Fundamental elements, leadership, which we're not going to have a lot of time to talk about today, but it has to do with an individual's role at a senior position in an organization and the impact that that person can have throughout the organization if you want to build a service culture. At the base, we have something we will spend some time on, which is service education. Notice I call it actionable service education. And we'll make the distinction in a second. And then there's this area in the middle, which is the third section of the book that you've received, Uplifting Service, that talks about the building blocks of culture. We'll touch on those at the very end of the hour. OK, so let's get down to the base. Notice that I've used the word education and not the word training. What is the difference? People talk a lot about customer service training. Very few people talk about service education. What fundamentally is the difference between these two words? You train someone, you train someone what to do in a certain situation, in a certain way, right? That's called a script. That's called a procedure. That's called a checklist. And it's very important in certain situations. For example, we put people into boot camp in the military so that in case bullets are flying and you stop thinking, your body knows what to do. When this fellow goes up in the air, I don't really want him to do creative thinking. <laughs> right? We put them in a simulator and we throw tough situations at them so their bodies are trained what to do, which is why no one died. Right? Because both the pilot and the co-pilot immediately went to the checklist. They'd been trained exactly what to do. When this fellow goes in, I don't want him to think out of the box. But in your business, in our business, we need people who can come up with new ideas. We need people who can think creatively about situations and be able to make good decisions for themselves without escalating everything. If all you've done is train somebody, do this in this situation, and that equals good service, rather than educate them how to think about service, how to understand fundamental principles and apply them in different situations, everything will get escalated and you'll become a bottleneck. I think. Getting people together like this works for this particular topic. We need to think differently about what else could we do or what else might a customer need. I also believe that it can be enjoyable. Because in this particular space called creating value through service, there is a skill set, but there's also the mindset. There is getting it right, but there's also having the right attitude. Yeah? So this has been working now all over the world. This group has taken what I'm showing you, translated it into 14 languages, and teaches it all over the planet to their team. This group up in Redmond is having a challenge with it because of the nature of the development-oriented culture, but is working on moving forward with the same technology. There's a group in India, 120,000 people working for Wipro. This is a group of investment bankers in London actually enjoying learning about giving people better service. This is in the Middle East, a group of people from a whole range of different companies, some of whom you serve. These are students in Singapore who are learning what I'm teaching you before they go out to get their first job. 
Interesting. They're going to go out and compete with everybody else who got a similar degree from a different institution. But when they go out, they can say, I also already understand what is the customer, what is service, what is taking action to create value, and I have my degree. Please hire me. So let's work on one of these right now. This is what I call the six levels of service. It's a fundamental principle. I'm going to start low. The word down here is basic. OK, what's the definition of that word? Talk to your partner, you have 10 seconds. Basic means what? <clears throat> okay, yell it out, tell me. Basic is? Fundamental, basic is? Minimum, basic is? <laughs> basic is basic, thank you, that, that's basic. So basic is the? The minimum, the minimum, but I'm gonna refer to this as what I call the bare minimum. And an example that most of you would have experienced at some point in your life would be to get into a taxi that smells bad, with a driver who's in a bad mood, and he's a bad driver, right? Did you enjoy the ride? No. Did he get you to your hotel? Yes. What level of service then did he provide? Basic. And here's how to say it. It goes like this. Basic. Try it with me. One, two, three. How do you feel? Depressed. <laughs> Depressed. Down, right? right? By the way, does that ever happen inside an organization? All the time? Bring. Okay. Let's take a step up. One step up is average. This is normal. This would be industry standard. The word I use is expected. And by the way, in the old world, what was the definition of customer satisfaction? Meeting customer expectations. You'll see how obsolete that is in just a few minutes. Okay? So expected would be like getting in the taxi and telling the driver where you want to go. Do you expect that he knows how to get there? Yes or no? Does it always happen? No. If you had a driver who says, where do you want to go? You tell him and he says, where's that? When he says, where's that, how do you feel, good or bad? <laughs> right, he could go the long way, he could go the wrong Now, eventually, he gets you where you want to go, so he meets the basic, but it's not what you, there's the difference. Here's how to say this one. Would you please cross your arms? Cross your arms, thank you. Take the sound of your voice and move it up in your nose. So it goes like this, expected. <laughs> one more time, here you go, one, two, three, expected. <laughs> Sounds like the finance department. <laughs> OK, just kidding, just kidding. So what happens if we go beyond expected? The next level is what I refer to as desired. When you take some action that creates some value for somebody else, and the value you create is what they were hoping for. It's where they say, ah, that's the way I like it. That's what I prefer, thank you for doing it for me that way. By the way, different people desire different ways, right? Some want it fast, some want you to take their time. Some want flexibility, some don't make me think. Some just want the lowest price, some want to know all the options, right? So when we take action that creates value the way they like it, that level is called desired. Here's the way to say this one, a little morning exercise. Would you please move your shoulders? Just move your shoulders, there we go. What's the matter? Your shoulder's broken. Come on, come on. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, and add the sound. Desire. Try it. One, <laughs> two, three, go. Here we go. Desire. Aren't you amazed that we're doing this? So show me the three levels. Down low is what? One, two, three. Basic. Cross your arms. One step up. Expected. And shoulders. Desire. Okay. It's 8.30 in the morning and you're here. Chances are there are some other people who are on their way to work or are already at work. And if we had a video cam and an audio pickup to see exactly what your colleagues were doing, can you identify some things that your colleagues would be up to that somebody else would say, yeah, they did it, but they really just did the bare minimum? Basic. Is there something else that the camera might pick up where you looked at it and you'd smile, you'd go, I'm so glad they did that, because you realize the person they did it for would say, ah, thank you. That's what I hoped for. That's what I 
desire. Now, they may not use exactly that word, but you get the distinction, correct? Okay, talk to your partner. Does this actually happen where you work, that some people go to work and they do what they do, but the other person's experience of it is down here, and that at other times, the other person's experience about it, colleague or customer, is at a much higher level? Talk to your partner, please. What's going on at your company right now? <laughs> Come on back. Let's keep going. There's more stairs. Down low, we have the bare minimum. It's called basic. Next one is expected, followed by desired. What's higher than desired? is when you do something for someone that they appreciate but they did not expect. It wasn't already in their mind, I hope. Right? That level I call surprising. Now let's do an audit. Has anyone ever given you a surprise gift or a gift that was supposed to be a surprise? Right? Birthday, Christmas. They thought of you, they bought something, they wrapped it up, they gave it to you, you opened it and you went, ooh! It really was a nice surprise. Ever happened? Has anyone ever given you a gift? They went out, they bought it, they wrapped it up, they gave it to you, and when you opened it, you went, <laughs> <laughs> And then you pretended to be surprised, to be polite. Okay? So it's happened to all of us. What was the difference in those two situations? Given that in both cases, the other person thought about you, took action, bought something for you, wrapped it up, presented it to you, intended to give you a nice surprise, but in one case it worked, in the other one, it didn't. What was the difference? Talk to your partner. That's right. That's right. The fundamental difference goes back to the fundamental definition of what is service. Service is taking action to create value for someone else. So in the case of, oh, they actually got something that you value. They understood you. They, they were current, right? They got to, oh, you didn't expect it, but you liked it. Over here, maybe they got you something that they value. Ever get one of those? Oh, I love it. I'm sure you're going to love it too. <laughs> No. <laughs> or maybe they got you something that you used to value, but your interests change, right? You've moved on and they're not current, so they're still taking the old action. Any of you have children, you probably know what I'm talking about. I still remember the day I bought my daughter a Barbie doll and she had outgrown the Barbie doll, right? right. Oh, dad. Now, what's higher than surprising is what I'll refer to as astonishing or incredible. I call it unbelievable. Right? This is above and beyond, off the charts. What's below basic is when you don't even meet the minimum expectations, right? When you literally violate some minimum legitimate expectation of the service you provide. That's terrible. It's awful. I call it And the way you say this one is you put your hands together like handcuffs. Go, so you did that very fast. That was prior. No. So put your hands together down at the bottom. It goes like a criminal. Here we go. One, two, three, and criminal. One step up. Base. Cross your arms. Anks back. Shoulders. These are hands. Surprising. This. Uh. <laughs> I got a whole table back there going, unbelievable. That's called a basic unbelievable. <laughs> Come on, Stanford, Silicon Valley, give me one unbelievable, unbelievable. One, two, three, unbelievable. <laughs> and what is the service like where you work? <laughs> that was the most thoughtful pause I've heard around the world in a long time. OK, important question. Where is excellence on the six levels? Excellence is not one of the words that I use to define six levels of service. And by the way, this applies to internal service providers, external service providers, service leaders, managers, supervisors, frontline, customer facing, internal facing. It makes sense for anybody. But my question is, where is excellence on these six levels? 
Why does one person say excellence is just meeting expectations on a consistent basis, hitting the service level agreement, doing the KPI, following the procedure, and somebody else is saying, no, we got to blow the customer away. Right? People have different opinions about this because these six levels are not fixed. This is not stairs. This thing is an escalator. And it's always going down. And what I mean by that is any organization in the room that does something new, the first time you, it's new! The next time it's not new, it's nice. And then nice becomes normal, and the normal becomes no big deal, and the escalators are going faster and faster and faster. Here's proof. <laughs> Don't laugh, that cost Google $12 billion, come on. But today we laugh! When it first came out, it was unbelievable. Today, basic. <laughs> So back to my question, if the stairs are slipping down faster and faster and faster, what does that mean? Where is excellence on the six levels of service? Talk to your partner again. Where's excellence if the stairs keep slipping down? Good. Excellence has become a moving target. And so if that's true, and I'll bet in your industry it is, then the only way to be excellent is to keep looking for that next step up, right? So excellence is taking the next step up. So then what is service excellence? Let's put the two definitions together. All service excellence is, is always looking for and taking the next step up that will create more value for someone. How many people in your company understand that? Right? Anybody who comes to work says, I know my job, I'm here to do my job, leave me alone, I'm doing my job. Doesn't understand that the stairs are slipping down. Now, a service excellence culture is where every single person comes to work every day, realizing that, yeah, I got to do what I have to do, and you have to do what you have to do, but the whole purpose of doing what I'm doing is for someone else, and so my focus needs to be on what else they need, how their needs or interests are changing, what else I can do to make things better for them. Clear? Let's apply this where you work. Okay, you all do something. Maybe you're handling email most of the day. Maybe you're on the phone. Maybe you're in meetings. Maybe you're writing reports. Maybe you're doing research and development. Maybe you're putting together new deals. What would be one example of doing one thing better than you normally do? And you could actually take that step. And if you did it, you'd know it was successful because someone else would say to you, ooh, thanks. Gee, that's better than normal. That's a step. They may not use the word a step up, right? But they would feel the impact. Now, I'm going to couple this with another principle, right? All service is delivered in a sequence. A sequence, it's a natural flow of, you know, this point, this point, this point, this point, this point. Whether it's getting a contract from expressed interest to sign deal, or whether it's uh, going to a restaurant from making a reservation to paying your bill and getting back out in your car, all along the way are what's called perception points. Jan Carlson years ago called it moments of truth. The reason I call it perception points is that these are the things that people see, hear, touch, smell, taste. Oh, by the way, it's also what they remember and tell other people about. So here's an example. At Changi Airport, there's a service transaction called arrival. It starts when your aircraft door opens and you step out into the aero bridge. Now, we've all done that, right? And don't you notice right away whether it's clean or whether it's dirty, whether it's air, right? Immediately, you're already forming an opinion. Then you step into the terminal building. Where's the signage? Where's the bathroom? Are there trolley carts available, right? Then you get down to immigration, if you're in an international situation. Then you go look for your bags. Then you're looking for a trolley again. Then you're going through customs. Then you're going outside into the arrivals area. Then you get into the taxi. The moment the taxi door closes, that transaction is complete. Now, of all those perception points along the way, the airport authority is not physically responsible for any of them. But they're concerned about every one of them, and they track them, because they have an aspiration. They want to be known as the best and friendliest airport in the world. But there was one point that kept getting low scores on the friendly assessment category in the survey. Think about it. From aircraft door to taxi door, what would be the one point that would keep getting low scores for not being friendly? Talk to your partner. Talk to your partner. What was it? Okay, you've experienced it. It was what? Great. It's not their job to be friendly. 
Their job is to check you out. But if your aspiration is to be the friendliest airport on the planet, you will not have an excuse and just say, well, that's the way it is. It's the nature of the job. So what they did is they dug in and they thought about asking the immigration officer to make small talk and blah, blah. But that would be a problem because there was a KPI called speed, right? So they analyzed it further and they solved the problem with this. They simply put a small container with little candies on every single immigration counter. And they taught the immigration officers a new script with one word, sweet. <laughs> That's it. Passport, sweet. The friendly score shot up. Now, this airport is not just about giving you a piece of candy. I mean, they are really drilling into creating a surprising, personalized, stress-free experience for 42 million people a year. So they put a butterfly garden in the airport. Now, one of the building blocks is called service benchmarking. And a lot of people think of benchmarking as competitive analysis. But there is no other airport in the world that has a butterfly garden. So where did they get that idea? Well, where else in the world do families go and have to spend some time, and sometimes there's high stress, Hospital, hospital. And some of the best hospitals in the world have gardens, gardens. And in some of the best gardens in the world are butterflies, where you can literally just stand still and they'll come and land on you. And you'll leave there going, what an airport. <laughs> they have a four-story slide to tire your kids out. <laughs> Wouldn't you appreciate that? What's that got to do with aircraft? It has, no, it has everything to do with this, which is what drives them. They're after giving you an experience, and whatever it is they can do to improve the value of your experience, to them, that's what turns them on. Now, this is B2C, what we were doing. This is pure B2B. Vopak is the largest chemical and oil storage company in the world. Shell, Exxon, Mobil, Texaco, et cetera, are all storing with these guys all over the planet, right? They took the same technology, and they mapped out all of the perception points on a very common transaction when a customer comes to the terminal. But then they did the hard work. They drilled down under every point to see at that point what would be criminal basic expected desired, surprising, or unbelievable. And because they have terminals all over the world that are doing the same thing, they could share easily now best practices, innovative things. Let's try this. It worked in this culture. It didn't work with that. That's what this customer appreciates. They keep it all in a database. Now You get it? Oh, then they did it again for visiting a customer at their office. And then they did it again. And then they did it again. And then they did it again. Even on something like handling a customer complaint or a compliment, they mapped it out. And every single perception point along the way looked at it from the other person's point of view, what would be violating minimum expectations, barely getting the job done, industry standard, the way they like it, how can we surprise them? Come on, let's blow them away. Unbelievable. Talk to your partner for a second. What might happen if people in your organization used a simple mapping process like this and actually drilled in to look at all of those points, would they be able to find some points that could be stepped up? Would they notice some that had slipped down? Would they see spaces where they can take action to improve? Talk to your partner, please. Go. <laughs> Whatever aha insight, new action you take is obviously going to be designed to create more value, but there's a problem. Is that true in your industry? Is that true for the colleagues you serve or the customers you serve? It is, right? That's why saying, here's the ISO 9000 script to follow the standard procedure, which will give us the standard result, has become obsolete. We need people who can think about, who am I actually doing this for? What's changing in their world? How can I create? Right, but we have to teach that, including to people like engineers. So I found a way to do it. Starts with a pizza. Is that a good pizza? OK, you're a vegetarian. Is that a good pizza? OK, you want the meat. Is that a good pizza? 
Oh, better. Okay, but let's. Okay, if you want the best pizza on the planet, I mean, if you want that, you know, thin crust and the special cheese and the spicy olives, right? If you want, you know, a really experience in your life one of the finest pizzas ever made, where do you go? Italy. You buy a ticket. You go on vacation. You go to Italy. You ah. <laughs> okay, hold, let me check. How many of you, when I said best pizza on the planet, you thought I'll just call them? You know, give these guys a buzz, right? Do they sell the best pizza on the planet? Do they sell a lot of pizza? How come? If it's not the best pizza, how come they sell so much pizza? Okay, so there's a price issue, but there's also a convenience, because all you have to do is give them a call, and they'll bring it to you. So if you and your spouse really want to have the best pizza, go to Italy on vacation. But if you want a pizza now for your two hungry kids, you're going to call one of these guys. Okay? Different categories of value. Quality of product, speed, convenience, access, delivery. Third category. Boom, boom. Pizza's here. 46.25. What are you going to give them? 46.25. Right? Now, what happens if the same guy... You open the door, you got your kid, he goes, hi, dinner's here, hot pizza. Do you like pizza? Me too. 46.25, ma'am. What are you gonna give him? 50, except for the finance guy, 46.25. <laughs> but the rest of us are gonna give him 50. Now, why did you give him the extra 375? Was it for a better pizza? Was it for a faster delivery? No, but it must have been for something that you b -b 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 valued. What was it? Yeah, there was something in his attitude, in his personal behavior, in his mindset that came across, and you valued it. Now, there's a fourth category. Bring, 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 bring. Good afternoon, Pizza Hut. May I help you? Yeah, hi. This is Mr. Kaufman. I'd like to order two pizzas. Oh, is this Mr. Ron Kaufman? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How'd you know? She says, Mr. Kaufman, you're one of our loyal customers. We love serving you. Aw, shucks. How'd she know? Yeah, inbound caller identification connects to what? Customer relationship database, right? Shows her my recent ordering history. She knows who I am before she picks up the phone. But when I ask, how did you know, she doesn't say, because we have inbound caller identification that connects to the database. <laughs> she says, Mr. Kaufman, you're one of our, we love. I say, well, I'd like two pizzas. She goes, like the ones you got last weekend? Yeah. You're calling from home, right? Yeah. <laughs> you want to use the same credit card? I go, that's why I call you guys. <laughs> we have a relationship. So what have we got? Four completely different categories of value. One of them is the quality of your product. It's your construction. It's your design for the chips. It's your loan terms, right? It's the deal, right? One of them is, how do I work with you? What are your hours of operation? Are you online? Are you over the phone? Are you mobile? Will you come to me? How long does it take? How convenient is it? Another category is the one that people tend to think about when they hear the word service. You know, are they friendly? Do they smile? Is there a politeness? And the fourth category is, how well do you know me? How well are you designing your next offer to create more value for me because you understand my world and my customer? Now, in these four categories, you can put them together. I just call it the big picture. Which of these categories does a customer value? All of them. Which of these categories does a colleague value? All of them. It's the experience that people value. And now there's a fundamental diagnostic tool that's not difficult that even, honestly, some of our biggest clients are IT companies because engineers go, got it, now I can diagnose this thing. I can take it apart. In fact, I can even put that in each and every one of these four categories and start to see where are we strong, where are we weak, where are we slipping, where are things moving fast, where are they moving slow. Time out. Which of these four categories can you right now see, whoa, in my department or in my company, here's an area we should be stepping up? Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's face it, we have some of the smartest people on the planet in this part of the world. 
The really smartest ones are obviously in the room. Right? And all of you realize now, no matter what it is that you do, you're in service to somebody else. But how many times did you actually study and learn about fundamental principles of service? It's not generally taught. right? And it's not something that you can send somebody to a class once and say, OK, that's done. I mean, how many times did you learn math? And did you learn reading and writing, right? I mean, it's something that we need to study and keep developing. So what I've shown you is a piece of some of the fundamental principles about service improvement that are in the classes that I've created. And there's other classes and more principles, and there's even more after that. And everything I'm showing you here is in the book that you got free this morning. So what was that thing in the middle? Let me take a moment on this as we wrap up. There's 12 of these. Every large organization is already doing all 12 of them as common practice. But they're maybe not doing it as a best practice or a best practice to build a strong culture. And this is where this happens. This is where we say we're about that, but we promote a person like that. We make this marketing promise, but the guy who gets the bonus is for doing this other thing over here. And it can be confusing. The name of the game is to get these things lined up. And these are the 12 categories. I have time this morning to just give you a couple of examples. Let's nail this one, vision. When I started working with this company, their marketing department had just come up with a new positioning statement to differentiate them from Ericsson, Alcatel, Lucent, and Huawei, their major competitors. And it was this, Nokia Siemens Networks, knowing how. Well, that's perfect if you're a German Finnish company, <laughs> right, that's focused on your IT, your engineering, your design. No, we know how, right? But in today's world, that's not necessarily a strong competitive position when there's so much coming from other parts of the world at lower price that could be perfectly adequate. So I leaned in with them. I said, OK, I got it. You know how. But so what? Nobody cares what you know until you show them that you can do something with it. So we added this, know how, act now. OK, now we're halfway there. What's the purpose of taking the action to create b -b for? How much value do they want to create? Expected? That's not a very competitive position in today's world anymore, meeting customer expectations. Right? So they realize, know how, act now for the following reason, to create. Ah. And what's interesting about that is wow is not in what you did. Wow is what the other person experienced and what they said about what you did. And they've now got 60,000 people around the world working with this as their service excellence vision. So every single person in the company facing customers or facing colleagues is waking up with this. In fact, they put it on the back of all their business cards because they want the people that they serve and work with to know that that's what they're committed to creating. What's your service excellence vision? On the building block called service communication, what's on the screensaver? What's at the bottom of your signature file? What's in that video clip that the CEO did? What's on the agenda for the meeting? What's on the walls? So Changi Airport, 28,000 people. Every single day, first thing, they have to go through security. Second thing they see, boom. Oh, now if you turn right or you turn left, you walk down a long hallway, and on that hallway, constantly, ceiling to floor, are these major posters that all have one common theme. And every time I go to the airport, I walk down that hall. I like to go through the staff entrance just to kind of see what's going on. Every single quarter, all these posters change. But they're just constantly about service. Now, I get that this is a B2C service environment. That's what they're really about. But how do you become number one in the world? By keeping that topic, service, 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 on people's minds. So what's on the walls where you work? Really? What's in that pantry area? What's on your screensaver? How long has it been there? How fresh is it? Right? Everything I'm showing you here, every quarter, it changes. Now, if you don't have really cool looking walls at our website, there's 100 high resolution posters in color, all copyright provided. You can download them for free, print them out. Don't put 100 on your wall all at once, OK? But <laughs> you can go there and get them all and then use them. Here's an interesting one. This is where Singapore Airlines really stands out and makes a lot of money. Now, when people see this, they usually think about money. Huh. Singapore Airlines goes the other way. They are cost effective on the inside, service excellent on the outside. So if you see it, they'll spend money on it. If their staff see it, <clears throat> and the staff are proud of that. 
They've created a very intense culture. So the most prestigious award that you can win is called the Managing Director's Award. What did they do? They named an award after the top person in the company. Who? But it didn't cost them anything. Number two, the only way you can win the award is by doing something that aligns with their vision, which is service even other airlines talk about. So you can't win the award for following procedure. You have to do something that some other airline would say, wow, did you see that? Then the award itself is a dinner with the managing director. It doesn't cost much because the airline caters the dinner. <laughs> During the dinner, they take a photograph of you, if you're the winner, receiving an award, which is a certificate, piece of paper, with your mother or your father or your husband or your wife standing in the picture too. So you get the certificate and you get a copy of the picture. Where does the certificate go? Up on the wall. Where does the picture go? Goes home. What's the impact of that? Everybody's family is also now tied into the fact that the person works there. In Asia, that means she can never quit. <laughs> then they take the same story and they write about it in the newsletter that goes out to 25,000 staff and 65 stations all over the world. That doesn't cost anything because they're doing it already. And they've created, look at that. It's not that they've spent more money. They've just focused themselves on always focusing all their people on creating the same outcome. Taking action to provide service that even other airlines would talk about. What kind of recognition can service providers get in your organization? What if somebody does an outstanding service recovery? What do they get? What if they come up with a service innovation for improvement between departments? How do they get recognized? What if a new person comes in and tries something new and does well? How's the other people in the company going to know it? It's a very interesting topic, this service recognition, because it doesn't have to cost anything. And you could do it with a text message as you're leaving here today just by thanking someone else. This gentleman is known as the Bill Gates of India. His name is Azim Premji. He's worth $14 billion. He owns a company called Wipro. Wipro is an IT company, a bunch of engineers, software developers. They do all kinds of back-end work, systems integration, convergence, thought leadership, etc. An engineer sent me this. I'd never met him because he was taught by somebody I taught to teach within his company. That's how we scaled. Interestingly, in the red box were these metrics. Okay. They found some way to track an ROI or at least an impact of this service improvement effort found a way to measure what matters. I want to know what matters where you work. Some companies will say, well, you know, service is nice to have, but it's not essential. If our technology is better, we'll win. Some people say it's really just about the price. So how would you know whether or not you're actually getting an impact, a return, on a service improvement program or a service improvement effort to improve inside your organization? Talk to your partner. What would you measure? What is it that matters? Let's check. How many of you said, fundamentally, the purpose of business, and if we're going to improve service, has got to be to make more money, increase our share, or increase our shareholder value? Are those legitimate things to measure, yes or no? Absolutely. Ultimate objectives. Now, what's the precursor? How would you know you're going to get that? Might be that your index scores are moving. Your customer loyalty ranking is going up. Your satisfaction rating is going up. You're winning a JD Power Award, other, right? What's the precursor of your index scores going up? People are saying nice things about you. So, hey, I appreciate that. Wow, that was really good. Never did that for me before. Thank you so much. Now, here's the key. What's the precursor of somebody giving you a positive comment like that? Somebody doing something. Right? Somebody actually coming up with an idea, taking action, which results in somebody else going, great, so that when you survey them, they go, oh, so they, co and they come back and buy from you again. Which of these four do leaders frequently focus on? Where are most of the people working in a large organization focused every day? Where do they have an opportunity to do anything about it? Right down there at the bottom, right? So imagine if your metric was, how many new actions have we taken today? How many new action steps have we taken for the people that we serve? 
rather than, well, what are the survey results or how come they didn't buy from us? Some of these are easy to implement. You can tweak them like that. Some of these take an investment in time in a roadmap to actually use this as an architecture to engineer the development of a culture. Don't try to change everything all at once. People will think you drank Kool-Aid. Right? What you want to do is really think through where's the opportunity. But this last one and my last story is because if you do all those and your own personal role model is not showing that you believe it, will other people believe that you're serious about it? No. no. If you're working on the other ones, and they're not right yet, but you're working on it, but your personal role model is strong, will people believe you? Yes. Right. So this was taken in Sweden. An American consultant went to a Swedish factory. He was from California. He wasn't used to the weather. He got picked up at the hotel by his Swedish colleague. They got to the factory really early. And the guy parks way at the far end of the parking lot away from the factory. Parking lot's empty. Bundles up and starts to walk across the parking lot to get to the factory. The American, no choice, is doing the same and finally gets into the factory shivering and looks at his Swedish colleague and goes, why did you park over there when all these things were empty here? And the Swedish guy looked at him and said, what do you, you don't understand? He goes, no, I'm freezing. He said, well, we're here early. I know. Why didn't we park? No, but then we had all the time in the world to walk across the parking lot. It's our colleagues who come later closer to the time that we open who will need the convenience of being able to park closer to the building. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> Service is taking action to create value for someone else, and an excellent service culture is where everybody understands and applies that every day. The architecture, or I call it the proven path to building a culture that delights your customers, your colleagues, and everyone else you meet, is what the uplifting service book is really all about. But what I'm really all about is bringing this to every single person on the planet. And so if you will take what you've got this morning and share it with other people in your life, then you help to make this mission come true. I'd like to say thank you for that and for being here this morning. Hands up. Turn to your partner. Repeat after me. Oh, partner. Oh, partner. Thank you for being my partner. Thank you for being my partner. Give him a high five. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Thank you. To order copies of this program or for information about other Stanford titles, please call 415-381-9363.